This is my day for exhortations. The, the Silandaras, the Bhikkhus, <laughs> the full moon of January, the first full moon in 1989. It's probably somebody's birthday, I think Placido Domingo. <laughs> And so this time also, it's good to, it's important that we reaffirm our commitment to this retreat, to the silence, to reaffirm our determination, aditana, to be resolute in our practice. This having the opportunity to practice and and dhamma, we you really uh, it's really a rare and wonderful thing to be able to to contemplate and say that just the the way things are, including from the the most ordinary conditions to to the to the real reflection in inside into an ultimate, into ultimate reality, or emptiness, the condition and the unconditioned. This is really taking the human experience to its fullest. You can't really uh, ex- do anything more than that. That is, that is the complete and total understanding, is to see that perfect relationship of the condition with the unconditioned. Oftentimes this is represented as a, as the marriage between uh, the male and the female. Sometimes the female is, is, uh, is represented as the unconditioned, the formless. The male is the conditioned, the form. And this, or whatever, uh, quality you give to it in, in, in symbols, it's that, it, it's the positive negative and, and the, the, um, the totality and that which manifests and disappears. What arises ceases. And so in, when, in that, in that perfect marriage or that in that uh, perfect relationship, then that is that is beyond just the t- making preferences, isn't it? Uh, we're not seeking just the unconditioned and and rejecting the condition, but we're we're going back to the the ultimate perfection of that oneness, where they're in perfect harmony rather than divided, separated. Some materialism, of course, is only only pays attention to the conditioned realm, isn't it? It's modern materialism and modern attitudes are very much about uh, trying to make the conditions perfect, isn't it? Trying to make everything perfect on the conditioned plane. And here in Western Europe, of course, there's been a since the Second World War a kind of Fantastic attempt to to uh, produce uh, uh, the with with our modern science and technology the the best that you can possibly think of and manifest it into material form what we would what what we need for comfort and beauty and and uh, pleasure in this project productions from the human mind have been created manifested into the world we get this. This uh, kind of overwhelming uh, materialism, which is never satisfying, it's never satisfying. It's, no matter how efficient 
beautiful, uh, comfortable, we might be able to create a material world around us. It's something, something totally unsatisfactory about it. In fact, you find some of the most discontented people in these countries like this one, or kind of affluent countries where they, they have everything but contentment. I was reading about the, the, uh, all these uh, immigrants trying to get into these Western European countries from the Third World, especially they, they were dying to go into Denmark and Sweden and the Scandinavian countries where they have these super-duper social welfare systems where you're just abs- things laid on for you from from birth to the grave, and then every absolute security from just being born in Denmark means that you're going to be taken care of till you die. And it's totally laid on by an affluent, wealthy society. Must. That sounds really wonderful, doesn't it? Especially, I suppose, if you come from a third world country where you, where you don't have that security, where you have to kind of scrounge around to try to survive. And uh, nothing's laid on for you. From the time you were born, you more or less struggle to keep going. And yet, countries like that have high suicide rates and alcoholism and other kind of horrible problems that... that uh, that human society, humans tend to create out of this, this, uh, that, that the, the conditioned realm as an end in itself can only be suffering. It's only dukkha as an end in itself. Which doesn't mean a put down of the conditioned realm. It needs to be related to the unconditioned, doesn't it? It needs its partner. It needs its perfection. In, in, and in itself, it has not, it can't be perfect. It, it because it's it's only a part. It arises and ceases. This is why the Buddha pointed to the the way to end of suffering through the realization of these four noble truths, which is, is the is the way that one can actually uh, know this through practice, through contemplation, through our ability to reflect using it our reflective capacities to their to, to their fullest. This is what we're doing on this retreat, I hope. What I'm doing anyway. What you're doing, only you know. A conditioned realm, we, we can create conditions with our minds, just like you create signs to meditate on. You can create images in your mind, you can create lights. Once you begin to realize the power of creation that, w- that we have, so many, so many of, of you are conditioned by a society that, that, uh, has not developed or even it re- really understands that power. We're very much conditioned by life, aren't we? We're, we're put into schools at a young age and, and then we are conditioned by the value systems and the, and, and the whole educational programming of our respective societies, which tend to make us uh, sometimes quite... See, you know, not really fully appreciate the the uh, the, the real uh, wonders of our existence and capacities as individual beings. I remember when, when I was a young uh, university student, feeling quite quite depressed uh, and and uh, a sense of despair over the values that that had been kind of instilled in my mind up to that time about that you you were kind of it was everyone was trying to be very uh 
analytical about themselves in those days. And one always came out with the feeling that you were kind of permanently uh, and somehow not quite right person. There's, there was a sense of normality that that you believed somehow existed somewhere and that you didn't quite fit into it. And somehow you weren't, you somehow missed the mark. And there was this vague sense of what was considered normal by the society in America of the 50s. And then you, you felt, well, I personally felt that I didn't, I somehow missed out on that. I didn't feel that I fit into that, into what was considered normal. But I thought everybody else did. Except a few oddballs or something. And I thought that I was probably the only, you know, one of those abnormal beings that just would somehow got here and, uh, and by mistake or somehow <laughs> it was a, it was a mess up birth or something wasn't quite right <clears throat> and used to feel quite envious of what what I considered normal people what were considered normal types of American people That attitude about oneself and there is very being brought up in a in a society where having a personality and being somebody is so important being a, a, an, a an individual a person and there's very much the emphasis of my generation was to was that it was an, a generation for uh, proclaiming your independence and your uniqueness in your personality. And yet, with all that, there is this underlying sense of not quite being normal or not quite right. So, the, even, in the, even in a society that had so many advantages and so, was so generous, there was also uh, this, this sense of anguish and despair that somehow you were stuck. Uh, somehow you've been, God had dealt you a uh, a bad hand. Why did God de deal me such a such a bad hand? Why did, why couldn't He have dealt me a good one? <laughs> but all this is related to the conditions uh, and the importance of of the values that people place on on uh, the society, on political attitudes, social attitudes, and fashions of the time, so forth. Nothing was ever related to... Even God was, was a silly God. The God that, that I was uh, brought up with in, a, in my Christian family was, a, was, a, was a, to me a silly God couldn't believe in it after I grew to a certain age it was what what was presented to me as God seemed so stupid that I just I'd rather not believe in anything that's foolish and so then even there the, even God was was uh, was presented as a person just some kind of another person that was uh, that, you know which was just a separate Thing, which tended to to uh, always be in the state of anguish because we were sinners. So we, we used to say that God suffered because we sinned. So I, I had these images of God, in, you know, sitting like Rodin's thinker in utter despair over me. Oh, if, if it's just me, think of all the billions of other people. He must, it would be hell realm to be God. <laughs> 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 then something in me kind of 
thought, well, it was stupid of him anyway to create such a thing and have to suffer from it. <clears throat> if you're going to create something, create something that you're going to thoroughly enjoy and not be a state of anguish over all the time. And especially one found that that, that growing up in the maturing process of, of, a, of a young boy and, and growing into manhood and all these things were strange things were happening and strange feelings arose and, and these were all totally unexplainable in the context of the society and the values that I grew up in. It was all seemed somehow the wrong suggestions were given and the wrong uh, attitudes were instilled in the mind so that one felt one was always uh, quite anxious or worried and never content not there was something missing, some some something wrong with it all, or or maybe it was just me. Maybe there was something basically wrong with me. Because it's easy to interpret life from that, from always from, because that's who's feeling it, isn't it? It's me that feels it, everything. And I can feel sympathy with your suffering, but. I actually feel my suffering. I have to be with it. When I came across Buddhism uh, at the age of 21, it was a, a relief to the mind to be able to reflect in, in a way that, that was encouraged in that particular religion. Because I'm uh, intuitively, uh, I I felt very much in tune with that way of thinking, with Buddhist thought, because it seemed somehow to explain and answer the questions that that we couldn't be answered through the other. And this is this is very much dealing with the relationship of the of this life as a conditioned being existing, existence itself in all that that implies. Existing is what is like this, isn't it? Existing is is having form and having consciousness. It exists. Existence is what springs forth, what arises. So existence is is what we what we contemplate, this sense of arising, of that which springs forth, the thoughts that arise and cease in our mind, the feelings that the change in our bodies and in the moods and the the whole conditioned realm that we can contemplate and reflect on during this retreat. Whatever it is, and we're looking at it now as conditions that arise and cease. The pay sankarani cha. All conditions are impermanent. Including the feelings of being somebody or being uh, whatever whatever feelings or fears or that you have about yourself as a person, you're no longer trying to to figure out why you feel that way or whether it's true or not. But you're observing it as it is that that it arises and ceases, and, that, and you're looking directly at the way it is. That's Buddha contemplating Dhamma. That's not a person who's who's been dealt a bad hand by God or somebody who's normal or abnormal or somebody who's whatever, because whatever it is, whatever the quality of the condition, we, we're no longer judging, we're just observing. It's conditionedness that it, that it arises and ceases. So these three characteristics, anicca, dukkha, anatta, that the conditioned realm is dukkha. Now that might sound like a to people as a, as a kind of a negation of life. But it's merely a, a reflection that 
condition, the nature of conditions is un, is is that is their unsatisfactoriness in themselves. There's no condition that is satisfying to us in itself. Conditions arise and cease, so it, it's it's unsatisfactory as something to identify with and grasp. Not that there's that there's like these flowers, they're conditions, aren't they? But we can't say we can't we we aren't looking at them as they're they're causing me suffering. That's not what I'm saying. By looking at them, that I'm suffering. Not that that flowers are are suffering, but that flowers, their nature is to change. That they're 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 conditioned, so that they arise, they cease, they. They they bloom and then they fade. That's their nature is to be like that. So that so that flowers can be appreciated for what they are, rather than demands made on them to be something that they they cannot be, because the mind that is contented and at ease with life and at peace is is a mind that is always aware of the relationship, the perfection of of the whole rather than trying to seek security, safety, perfection in in a condition or in the conditioned realm. This is the materialist mentality of this age has tried to very much find uh, a paradise, trying to create a paradise if we could just ex- extend our lifespan, we could live longer and, and in perfect health, in, in nice places with good food and everything, all the best. And yet, what have we managed to do? We've found pollution and all these things becoming increasingly a threat. That we have to pay the price of, of our greed and our stupidity by polluting the environment that we've been trying to make into a paradise. And the way we just dump waste and rubbish and sewage into into the seas and the oceans. Thinking that it that the oceans are like bottomless pits. You, you can the, the sewage goes in and it just goes down, 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 down. Because the oceans to us are bottomless, aren't they? Can't see. Once you throw it into the sea, you can't see it. It's all gone. Nice. <laughs> That's what we do with our minds, isn't it? We just we try to dump the rubbish in the ocean and uh, hope that it just stays down there where you can't see it. <laughs> <laughs> Until eventually you start feeling a sense of being polluted. You don't know where it's coming from. (laughs) So that we, just by throwing things into the ocean, just because they disappear and you can't see them doesn't mean they don't have their effect on our lives. We're discovering that with our heedlessness and stupidity in, in, in just dumping waste and filth and that into into the very bloodstream in, of, of a planet, isn't it? It's the currents of the oceans and, and all that that is so important. Circulation, circulatory system of the planet. Mm. And then it's not only the wicked industrialists that suffer, but it's it's all the everyone else, the innocent, like this, the animals, the fish, and so forth. I mean, they get, you know, they haven't done anything wrong, but they they still have to suffer for our greed, hatred, and delusion, our stupidity. So the innocent have to suffer along with the guilty in this in this planetary life. And it, we're 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 in on the same boat. Well, we're all in this together, in other words. It's, it's like you, you can't just... Um, damn, I will have nothing more to do with this planet 
You can say such things, but just by our existence here means that we're related and interconnected to the whole of it. That means everything, the good, the bad, the guilty, the innocent, the, the totality of it. But the great gift of, of our humanity is that we're, we're these little points that can be enlightened. And these, these strange karmic formations that, that we call human beings. And that we, we can also be enlightened beings, which is an enlightened being is, is a blessing to all beings, isn't it? An enlightened human being understands the truth of the way it is and so our lives then are uh, can be great blessings to to other beings to all other beings or an ignorant human being can be a, a nuisance a dangerous threat I mean right now that it's, it's possible to to uh, set off all the nuclear weapons or or these, the chemical warfare the chemical uh, weapons and that, that, that the demonic minds of people have invented. You think of some of the incredible, the most horrible things that people invent to kill each other with. And these, these are supposedly from civilized uh, countries. And we, we spend so much money, energy, intelligence in inventing horrendous weapons to scare each other with. Hopefully we think we won't ever have to use them, but we're, we can scare each other with them. And yet that mentality seems to, maybe we're, hopefully we're growing out of that there seems to be more movement away from that kind of uh, carrying a big stick and flexing your muscles and shaking your fist and looking mean and nasty and frightening everybody to death. <laughs> because human beings can be lights in the dark. They can be enlightened beings. Now, beings are like this, aren't they? They're separate. Being implies that we, there are all kinds of beings on this planet that we can actually see. All the animal, the insect, the, the bird, the fish, the beings that are of the animal realm, we, we can actually visually see. We suspect and intuit beings of, of maybe ethereal types or Devas or angels or deities or whatever. The being is, is a sense of, of, uh, encapsulation in some form, either a, a coarse material form such as we have or maybe a, an ethereal form such as a deva. But being Im implies a, uh, something that exists in its, as a separate, uh, functioning entity. So we, we are sentient beings. Beings are sentient, aren't they? They're, they? They are born and they die. They begin and end. That's true with all beings. And we can, as we realize with the animal kingdom, insect and fish and fowl, there's also, the, in the uh, cosmology of Buddhism, Hinduism, there's the devas are also born and die. The Brahma gods are born and die. The, the, anything that has a form that is a being is something, is something that is born and dies. It's a condition, in other words. Now the human being then is a being that can reflect on the way things are within the limitations uh, that we find ourselves. We have this reflective mind is what we're using, what we're developing in, in meditation here, is the, the ability to reflect on existence, on the way things are. And it's, it's, it's not something that you can just do overnight, is it? Just a, 
uh, one meditation retreat and you've got it because it is a lifetime of reflection it's learning to 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 observe awaken to life and the experience of being and breathing and feeling and consciousness through through the lifetime of this being here it's it's life span because this is the resultant karma of birth. And when it's time for this, this being to die, that's not for us to say, is it? it when that time comes, that's, up, that's, that's the karma, that's up to karma. That's not, we're not trying to, to make any deals for a long life or for a short one. Not trying to I want a really long life. Or to to think we be nice to have a short one, get enlightened and die. I have to live through the eighties and nineties in an aging, deteriorating old body. <laughs> it's pretty hard going sometimes, isn't it, Sister Upala? <laughs> <laughs> the eighties, the physical eighties. <laughs> but yet the karma is is this. It's it's the it's what we can reflect on. And this is what we we accept. Uh, and we we're willing to to take on the the karma. We we can determine it. We can say this to ourselves. We can make that our intention to accept the karma of our lives, the way things are as we experience it as an individual being. In that way, we're no longer just reacting and conflicting, or or trying to get out of anything but we're actually quite willing to accept the, the resultant karma of our birth in whatever forms and uh, pleasant or unpleasant uh, they may, those qualities may be. Because this, this form is something that if what we do with it, think with it, say with it, it, it affects it. That it, 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 it becomes what if we speak out of ignorance and greed, hatred, and delusion, then it has its its effect on this form, and on the and on the planet we live on. We're not just uh, you're not uh, totally isolated and independent from the environment we're living in, are we? We're very much a part of the of the totality, of the whole of this universal system. So sometimes we might think, what I do is my own business. I can live my life the way I want to. It's my business, my life. None of your business, not your life. That's how oftentimes we're, we're brought up to think, isn't it? I'm an independent, totally independent person. So it's my life and I can do with it what I want. But when you contemplate Dhamma, you realize that it's not really your life and that it is everybody's business. <laughs> because how I live my life is, is going to affect you, isn't it? What I do and say and think is is going to is going to have its effect on you on the on the planet and if I live and act and speak and do things in unskillful heedless selfish foolish ways that's going to affect everyone else but if I live in a way that is moral and and skillful virtuous caring, careful, then that is, that's, that's for the welfare of other beings. Because 
this this form here then is is um, is being used as something for the that is a blessing, helping, a benefit to others. <clears throat> and so, therefore, we we begin when we, we when we realize that, have that insight, then we we really uh, long to do what is right, what is good. At least I do, to because uh, not only for for my own uh, happiness, but because I don't want to be responsible for causing more suffering to to you than than uh, necessary because you create enough suffering already for yourself and without you know and I'm sure you don't need me to create more for you do you do you want me to make you suffer more <laughs> I'll become really selfish and cruel and So you you increase your suffering, but I see that you know that 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 is uh, that 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 would be wrong to do. That the suffering that 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 is important to see is the suffering you create in your mind, not the suffering that somebody causing you because they are being nasty and wicked and cruel and selfish to you. But it's actually in a in a community like this, where people are trying to be kind and careful and considerate and, and respectful to each other, where you don't have, you, you aren't uh, trying just to survive and, and try to hold your own in a, in a system that is cruel and brutal and tyrannical, but where you're actually living in a moral community that's aspiring to realize ultimate truth and then you can be aware of the suffering you create even even un, under the best circumstances. And from there, that's why if, uh, if you, you know, to develop Dhamma practice, you really need to have, uh, you need to have that foundation of sila of moral commitment, and to have uh, spiritual friends, kalyanamitas, people that encourage and help and support each other toward the holy life. Because if you are living in a society where people are brutal and cruel and unkind and are just taking advantage of you, exploiting you, you your mind has to deal with survival. Don't you? You're, you're just living in a in a realm of instinctual survival, and you don't have time to contemplate ultimate reality. You're just trying to make it through this life and on the instinctual plane of just trying to to exist and survive in a in an unwholesome, brutal, unkind system you find yourself in. So that's one reason why the Buddha established the monastic form, a monastery monastic life where actually you you're living with people who are developing in the in the in that spiritual way where you ten, where we tend to attract to us and you find most of the people that come here to Amaravati are quite wholesome and good types of human beings we we, we seldom have problems with like tra- tra- attracting criminals and and uh, terrorists and gangsters and drug addicts and all the kind of violent uh, world uh, that exists, doesn't it? it? Still exists in London and places like that, but we don't really see it because th- those kind of beings stay away from places like this. They can't bear it. They see a Buddhist monk. All they can do is yell at you, some insult you. You know, walking to Hemel Hempstead, some of these lorries come by, or men in cars coming, looking like they they haven't uh, any kind of intelligence whatsoever. They just shout some horrible thing at you because all they see is all they. <laughs> 
or they, they just react to something strange. It's like a like a cat seeing a mouse. That they don't understand it. They think they just they just react with with some kind of foolish, stupid reaction. They wouldn't think. What are these? What are these monks? What are these nuns? Why do they do that? Why do they? Why do they? Those women shave their heads. Why don't they? Why don't they grow their hair out and curl it and wear beautiful dresses? Why do those? They don't reflect, do they? They contemplate it. They just ah, skinhead and. <laughs> Now then, but then the people that do question, why, what did they, what are they, why do they, what did they believe in, why did they live that way, what did they do, wonder what they, what they, what they're doing, what is meditation, then you're, you're beginning to question and ask, that means your mind is searching for something, isn't it? it's, it's beginning to reflect, why, why is it like this, why do they do that, because it's obviously not, you know, the whole appearance, the presence of a samana is, is not, it, it's quite striking, isn't it? it? It leaves a firm impression on the mind. This is the, the, like, why we, when we look at the stars at night, we wonder, what is it all about? So that's a, that's a kind of reflecting attitude, isn't it? What, what is up there in that vast, unknown mystery, mysterious universe that we can only see little points of light with our eyes? What is this strange experience of, of being incarcerated in a, in a form like this for, for a lifetime. What does it all mean? And these are the questions that haunt hum, humanity and always have. And then what, what is the purpose of it? What is its meaning? Before, very hu- a few kind of exceptional human beings would ask those questions. Most people would be willing to just be told. And you'd go, go to church and the preacher tells you all about it and you believe it. They, they, they're all, all nicely written down and explained in scriptures and, and traditions and therefore you, can, you don't have to think about it or wonder about it because you've got the answers in a book. The priest can tell you. So you never develop a a reflective mind or that kind of penetrating, looking deep into into this experience of of being alive, because you so many human beings are just willing to to accept the answers uh, that they see in uh, from that they get from others or from books. What they're told that's nice to believe what somebody tells you who you think it knows but this this thing what we're doing here is actually we don't, we're not uh, in, in the Buddhist teaching it's not a doctrine of telling you what what everything is or what you should be but in investigating looking into the nature of things the Buddha seeing the Dhamma is the is that Take that as a kind of symbol. The Buddha contemplating the Dhamma. The awakened human mind open and reflecting on the way things are within this realm of this human realm that we have to live in for a lifetime. This evening is the all night sitting, but because of the amount of illness that this community's had over, since this retreat began, 
uh, whether you, uh, those of you who still don't feel very strong uh, or still dodgy, better not attempt to um, sit up all night. Uh, use your good sense in regards to these matters. I, you, you know how you're feeling, so I leave it up to you to decide what you think would be the wise thing to do. So, uh, anyway, whatever you decide, uh, it doesn't mean that you, you, just because you go back to your room doesn't mean that you don't reflect on the way things are, does it? So that it's not, uh, don't develop the vipassanini mind where you where you only meditate on a cushion but you you actually as say when you graduate out of the school of vipassaninis then you you're one who contemplates life as it actually is happening to you wherever you happen to be sitting standing walking or lying down in the shrine room or in the in your private room or in the kitchen or walking outside or standing. And you had a heart attack out on the out in the court yards, then you contemplate that, lying down. <laughs> Don't let anything throw you off the track. <laughs> 